We are blessed and privileged this week to have with us Pastor Pam and her husband Bill, and I will get out of the way at this time and let Pastor Pam come and give you the readings for the sermon and then the sermon this morning. Let's make her welcome, Pastor Pam. Good morning. From the Old Testament, from the Hebrew Bible, Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 19, verses 15 to 19. A single witness shall not suffice to convict a person of any crime or wrongdoing in connection with any offense that may be committed. Only on the evidence of two or three witnesses shall a charge be sustained. If a malicious witness comes forward to accuse someone of wrongdoing, then both parties to the dispute shall appear before the Lord, before the priests and the judges who were in office in those days. And the judges shall make a thorough inquiry. If the witness is a false witness, having testified falsely against another, then you shall do to the false witness just as the false witness had meant to do to the other. So you shall purge the evil from your midst. And from the Christian Testament, the New Testament, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 9, verses 28 to 36. Now about eight days after these sayings, Jesus took with him Peter and John and James and went up on a mountain to pray. And while he was praying... The appearance of his face changed, and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly they saw two men, Moses and Elijah, talking to him. They appeared in glory and were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and his companions were weighed down with sleep, but since they had stayed awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. Just as they were leaving him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. While he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were terrified as they entered the cloud. Then from the cloud came a voice that said, This is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone, and they kept silent, and in those days told no one any of the things they had seen. Here ends the reading from the Gospel according to Luke. My message this day is called Evidence. Other churches this Sunday are preaching on the transfiguration, what I just read from Luke, when Jesus and a few disciples went up on a mountain and were joined by Elijah and Moses. Jesus, Elijah, and Moses became bright, dazzling white, and a voice from the clouds said, This is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. Consider. Jesus and the boys went up a mountain. Two long-gone patriarchs, men of the faith, appeared. All three glowed like searchlights. God spoke affirmation from the cloud. Do you believe it? If you believe it, what do you believe? Maybe you believe Jesus is really the Son of God. Or maybe you believe Jesus was chosen by God. Or perhaps you believe that when Peter, James, and John came down that mountain, the others looked at them, asked what happened, and the guys said, we cannot describe it, but but it kind of felt like this. Or maybe you believe it happened exactly as described in Luke 9, or in Matthew 17, Or in Mark 9, belief. When you joined this congregation, you declared, I believe in God. 
I believe in Jesus Christ. I believe in the Holy Spirit. You stated your faith. You proclaimed your beliefs. Belief is confidence in something that cannot be proven. All of us who have joined this church or any other have faith claims, things we believe. And I believe that is a very good thing. Not just good for business, but good for your heart and your head to accept that the almighty creator of the universe is your creator, is the God who knows you, loves you, and expects something of you. On the other hand, sometimes belief is not enough. What if you were framed for a grave crime? Your mother believes you are innocent. <clears throat> Deuteronomy 19.15, a single witness shall not suffice to convict a person of any crime or wrongdoing in connection with any offense that may be committed. Only on the evidence of two or three witnesses shall a charge be sustained. Many of the rules or laws in the Old Testament are what lawyers call case law. Detailed rules about specific situations, such as paying damages when your livestock run amok. But others are more general rules. One witness is not enough to convict someone. To deprive a person of life, liberty, or property requires the evidence, the facts, and the weight of two or three witnesses. Back before fingerprints and DNA, they counted on witnesses. And this part of Deuteronomy goes on and on to describe what should be done with false witnesses, liars. People do that, you know, always have. Thus, more weight was required, more evidence. The evidence of two or three witnesses was needed to convict the guilty. Over the last decade, much has been made of military drone strikes. Those who have suffered the results of war may be thankful that American soldiers are not endangered to kill our enemies. But there are questions about when they should be used and against whom. A few years ago, when a former Navy officer and Los Angeles police officer was thought to have run amok shooting and killing current officers and their families, a news reporter asked a legal expert if drones might one day be ordered to kill such a murderer. No, was the quick reply. American citizens on American soil have constitutionally guaranteed rights to due process. He will have the right to an attorney. He will have the right to question evidence and witnesses against him. Facts matter. The evidence matters, and it must be fairly presented and examined. Hmm. Feels like something's in my shoe. It looks like something is in my shoe. Oh, a tiny rock was in my shoe. The evidence from my senses convinced me about the rock in my shoe. In 1831, a 20-year-old Charles Darwin arrived on the Galapagos Islands. Today is his birthday. The differences between animals on one island and the animals on the next island captured Darwin's attention. They looked very different. Why did the tortoises have such different shells? Why did the finches have differently shaped beaks? Darwin drew the creatures and their environments. He studied how they lived and what they ate. It turned out that the critters on each island were best able to eat the plants on their unique island. Dar Darwin offered an excellent evidence-based theory to explain the adaptations. His hypothesis, his theory, was that over generations and generations, the individuals best suited to a particular environment did better. The tortoise with the shell that allowed him to reach plants, even in the desert, stayed healthy and produced offspring that were even better suited to their desert island.
marvelous. We see this even in Ohio. An albino rabbit or fox or deer will have a short life. They are walking targets and they die young. This is called natural selection. The best adapted creatures tend to thrive and produce more babies. Since Darwin, science understands even more mechanisms beyond natural selection, even more mechanisms or tools of evolution, such as sexual selection. The prettiest, most elaborate male bird mates with the most females. And your brother-in-law will never, ever get a date. <laughs> Evidence leads to a hypothesis, which is proven by more evidence. And that is the stuff of a good mystery novel and good science. Trying to pretend natural selection and evolution do not exist, creationists teach children odd claims based on pure guesses. And what's interesting is the creationists themselves disagree. They have wildly different guesses. And different groups teach children different things. The creationist high school biology book of pandas and people claims that tigers have stripes because that is what they were looking at while they made it. The third edition of Life Science from Bob Jones University teaches that dinosaurs and people lived at the same time just a few thousand years ago in the time of King David. The facts tell us otherwise. Reverend Ken Samuel remembers his elementary school math book. It turns out all the answers to his homework problems were right there, easy as pie, in the back of the book. It was much faster to simply copy all those answers and get back to important things like Gilligan's Island. Until the teacher called him up to the front of the class to show how he got the answers. He had not actually done the work. Problem. Samuel refers us to the wisdom of Romans 12, 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Reverend Samuel writes about what he calls proof in our faith as opposed to swallowing the instant answers handed to us in confirmation class. Quote, according to Romans, the will of God is not determined by easy recitations or catechisms. The will of God must be proven. The will of God must be tried and tested. The will of God must be examined and discussed. The will of God must be discerned. True discernment will lead to some answers. But those answers will come only as a result of a process that opens us to other possibilities, other perspectives, and a deeper testing of our own values. And those answers will always be subject to the review of other discriminating minds." End quote. Though Samuel recommends against in faith, you can believe without doing the work, not in science. Are you open to all the possibilities? In science, if you make a claim that cannot be proved or disproved, that is not a scientific claim, a true, it's not good science. It does not work that way. It will not use evidence to find a valid solution, a true explanation. In science, if you do not even try to prove your claims, you're writing fiction, not facts. Or you are speaking of your faith. Faith is priceless. It carries us when hope might be lost. Yet faith is not science. Experimenters do not have faith in their techniques. The procedures are proven by evidence. Horse owners know that their beasts of burden have chestnuts on their front legs because their horse ancestors had more toes than that one hoof. 
Whales have human-looking fingers inside their fins and little remnants of back legs because their ancestors were land mammals called arteriodactyls, which 50 million years ago moved into the water to find more food. Today we have the fossil and DNA evidence which many of us find thrilling. It is no threat to my faith that the earth took shape over billions of years. It is no threat to my faith that we became human over millions of years. Consider how patient that makes our God. When we really mess up, we need to know that God has already spent billions of years on creation. No hurry. God is not giving up on you, not giving up on us. One claim creationists make is that God fudged the fossil record to test our faith. Really? Those fossils are lying. <coughs> Oh my, the source of all life is a liar. Nah, not going there with them. Mm -mm. One marvelous fact of science is how dependable are all the rules. It may take us a while to figure them out, but God is dependable. From time to time, a researcher will claim that he mixed A and B in D conditions and got Q. When a dozen other scientists repeat A plus B in D conditions and cannot get Q, they know the first fellow either made a mistake or he fibbed. Because the creator of heaven and earth and the way creation works is absolutely reliable. If our son, the chemist Clay, finds a process to make a more efficient conduction service, surface for solar cells, other chemists will be able to repeat his procedure and get exactly the same product. And even before humans understood science, we liked evidence. In the 65th Psalm that Ellie read, the mountains are proof of God's strength. Rain and flocks and grain fields are evidence of divine benevolence. The psalmist did not just believe in God. They saw the goodness of creation as proof. Yet we know that kind of proof is still a faith claim based on natural revelation God revealed in nature. A newborn baby is proof that God wants the world to continue. So says our faith, our belief. Today we want our children to learn logic and the scientific process because we know the world demands clear thinking. We want our teachers teaching science. We want nurses and detectives and food quality testers who understand how the world actually works. We believe our maker trustworthy. The world works. Evidence abounds. Just as the people of Deuteronomy, we want multiple witnesses. When we are charged with a crime, when we are diagnosed with cancer, we count on the evidence, the facts, to be reliable. And we know that belief is something different. Belief is confidence in something that can never be proved. We cannot prove God exists. We cannot prove God is good. We cannot prove that God created the earth or you or me. Those are our faith claims. Creationists want scientists to prove their faith. If we could prove our faith claims, they would no longer be faith. The Reverend Lillian Daniel has the prayer shawl her mother's church made her when she became ill. The shawl did not cure her mother's fatal illness. But for Daniel, quote, there is no question in my mind that it was a conduit of healing. That is her faith claim. She believes and is uplifted by her belief. Each of us is here worshiping God because we choose to believe 
or at least we have suspended our disbelief long enough to listen, long enough to open our hands and our hearts to the light of all lights, the ground of all being. Praise God. Amen.